what is really intriguing <clears throat> is two things. One, on the defense side, very rarely do we have a chance to really radically change the fundamentals of security. Um, I am very intrigued about zero trust and what that means about redefining security away from being network set or network centric towards being um, very flexible and being around the identity. I'm very intrigued about getting rid of passwords because my entire life we've been basing security around something that's easy to get wrong, easy to steal, um, and has been stolen a million and one times. We went and looked at like Troy Hunt's website the other day and uh, the password 123456 has been stolen 25 million times. I mean, it's, it's crazy the fact that we still put so much reliance on that. So there's some really intriguing inflection points around where security is and how we're gonna define it. That's one. Two, um, I was asked the other day at RSA, hey, well, if we get more secure, doesn't mean we're out of a job. Ideally, one day, uh, but uh, the billions of dollars that have went into uh, these cyber criminal organizations, from ransomware, from denial of service attacks, from fraud, the whole nine yards, these billions of dollars, they're not just going, hey, that's cool, we're just gonna keep doing the same thing, right? What are they doing? They're reinvesting in better tools, better techniques, better attacks. So at the same time, we're at this pivotal moment where we can redesign and rethink security fundamentals, we're at this very scary moment where the adversaries have never been better, and never been more uh, funded and more motivated to get us. I think we are facing obviously some really big issues um, as an industry when it comes to cybersecurity. I work on the human side, so my work is all about engaging often end users, whether that is board members or sort of general employees of an organization or at the consumer level. Some of the issues I see is that people want to be more secure, but for one reason or another, there's blockers in the way. That might be the technology is hard to engage with. It might be that they don't feel they have the knowledge or the confidence or the skills to engage in using that technology. It might be just they're really busy and security feels hard. It feels like an extra demand on their time and their resource and their energy. So we need to make security as frictionless, as well communicated, as easy to use as we can. We need to empower people so that they feel confident. And I think if we do that, we will really make more headways tackling one of the biggest threats I see in organizations, which is that of social engineering and of external cyber criminals taking advantage of non-malicious ac accidental insiders. Well, I think what we're, we're still hearing a lot about, it hasn't gone away and I don't think it will go anytime soon, uh, is the effectiveness of phishing attacks, how they're evolving, they're becoming more sophisticated, and they're starting to now, instead of targeting the masses with blanketed emails out there, they're a little more focused. So they're very credible, and, and they're tied in very closely with the, the strain of malware with ransomware. We keep hearing about ransomware. Why? It's effective. Why do we hear about spam? Spam is effective. So a lot of these different things that work they're working really well, but now they're honing in carefully. The cyber criminals realize if it's more convincing, if it's automated, they can monetize it much quicker. They could now put together reports of compromised information, sell it on the dark web, and they could focus it in niche categories such as medical theft, you know, ID theft. They can command a much higher dollar than just simply stolen credit cards. So I think a lot of the, the focus now is going to be dark web crawlers, in, uh, that, that are going to be focusing in on finding compromised credentials to quickly alert people. Uh, banks are using this already, and you may have seen that. You, you get a quick alert, hey, there's some suspicious activity, fraudulent activity, and helps you to respond quickly. And I think that is somewhat of the future. Well, among the biggest issues is the fact that, look, Remember the Y2K bug? Okay, most people were not even alive at that time, but the internet was much smaller and we had to have an internet-wide response to drive, you know, securing these systems that were all pretty much, um, you know, we were worried they were all just going to stop working. We haven't been able to solve that problem of issuing fixes at scale. It's not about creating the patch, it's about getting it deployed. And so with the growing number of computers and internet connected devices and IoT, this problem that we never got right over 20 years ago has simply 
continue to grow. And I think that that is one of our biggest challenges in cybersecurity. It's not necessarily getting the vendors to create a patch. It's about the entire patch deployment lifecycle after that. The cybersecurity business is has really taken a rapid transition in the last several years. Uh, I call it, um, if you'll forgive all my geek friends will forgive this, I call it we've hit peak geek in cybersecurity. By that I mean, that by the way, there's plenty of great work for geeks. But the model of the 70s, where I grew up, right, 70s, 80s, the heyday of computer security, formal methods for computer security, the idea was we will invent a technology, right? There will be technology that will save us and we're just waiting for this to happen. You know, all these kind of magic things that will happen. This brilliant people, you know, my predecessors, great brain power. How do I build operating systems that I can mathematically talk about their properties and their ability to preserve, you know, the desirable, who gets to look at data and change it and all that kind of stuff. Never happened, right? Because the marketplace, my gosh, if it doesn't run PowerPoint, nobody wants it, right? So you have to, you've got this tug of the marketplace and then you've got the sort of theoretical way that we would solve these problems. So the good and the bad news is over the last few years, what's really changed is we've shifted away from technology will save us to cybersecurity is just part of our life. All right, so it's about economic and social risk. It's not about technology solutions. How do I manage economic risk and social issues like privacy, right? All these kind of things that we have to deal with. And so we move from sort of the geek is the most important person, right? To how do people make executive business decisions? How do we decide as a population that something is safe or unsafe, right? Not perfect, but how do we make rational decisions about risk, which we do every day. If you fly in an airplane, you're in a tall building, you ride in an elevator, when you go to the doctor, you know, we have mechanisms in society to help us make better choices, right? Reasonable choices, not perfect choices. When that choice turns out to be not a good one, then there are consequences. And sometimes it turns into liability, right? Someone has made a mistake, failed to do something that was uh, a reasonable expectation. So we're moving into a world which is really about decision making. And that's actually the right answer in the long run, right? It's not, it's not fun getting there. Uh, there's plenty of great work for geeks, right? We won't go away because technology drives all this, gives us the great capability that we insist upon. It powers our businesses and our economy. But we can't think of this as we're going to solve it that way. We're going to have to deal with issues of public policy, you know, uh, whatever the right mix of regulation, of market incentives, and personal behavior. We, we have to figure that out. The answer today is different than it might have been some decades ago. Right? This is not like the national security problem where we pay our taxes, we raise an army, and we go fight bad guys over there. Right? This, is a, this is embedded in our economy, right? in the behavior of individuals and the way businesses uh, make their services available to the public. And so we have to really think of this in a different way. Uh, so it's exciting because it's so complex, right? and which makes it really difficult too. So, so these big issues of kind of the, the way we make decisions about risk, you know, get cascaded in these things. And, and most of this, frankly, is, is uh, hard to get ahead of. So the issues of what does 5G mean to us in the future and the privacy issues are being you know, openly debated every day. You know, new technology can, uh, brings a host of security problems, you know, things we didn't think about, but it also brings up opportunities too, right? The ability to have sort of different kinds of architectural choices in 5G would allow us to make, uh, you know, uh, and lots of smart folks are thinking about these. Uh, how do I build sort of architectures that don't, um, where the exposure of one doesn't cascade to everybody else? You know, I have the ability to, to really partition and rethink the way services are made available or authentication is done in a way that uh, really makes it more challenging for the attacker, right, to do these sort of mass market, large scale attacks. So I think there's a whole host of these around technology that, um, you know, again, are being played out in standards bodies and by competing interests from companies, uh, you know, today. I, so I did a recent talk at RSA about hackers' rights, and I broke it down at if we're ever going to change public awareness of how we look at security in general, but also how we're viewing hackers, and is that we're still using really out-of-date legislation. And this hurts the good actors. Um, and it's, it's becoming a real situation because if you still have that number of 60%, that's not changing about whether or not to submit a vulnerability, we're dealing with a real situation at the end of the day. Um, well, at RSA, the theme was the human element. And I'm very thankful that they picked that because 
humans are coders and you wouldn't have codes without the humans and I think the whole thing is we also need to take a look at the empathy part. So really trying to understand each other, having better communication with each other, and then also trying to work together to promote each other and uh, so we can have a constant good security so we don't have these breaches occurring as often. Um, the other thing is diversity and inclusion is a huge issue. So the thing is, is that we're ha we have so many companies right now that are investing in uh, all these nonprofits that work with like enhancing those that are usually underrepresented in the space. And what's happening is that even though they're doing that, what are they actually doing in their own office? Um, and when I mean diversity, I mean it could be also like the way you think as well. So it's not always what is the appearance, but what you think as well. And what I've noticed is that we are seriously dealing with a mental health issue in this industry. We have people that are getting burned out really fast because we're always on call, always on, at all hours. And we're also forced to work at certain times in a certain space. And that's not how it works for most people. And I mean, some people, they're more creative at night um, versus in the morning. That's one of them. And also the fact is that even if they are dealing with something that's very critical, that's really messing with their own personal health, they can't really tell their manager or HR because they're where they're going to get fired. And But the problem is, is that if you don't tell someone about that, then you might get fired because you're not getting the assistance that you need. And so I think we need to start looking at mental health as an actual physical situation. So if I have a broken leg or if I have diabetes, you know, HR usually respects that saying, oh, just work from home for these couple of weeks. Um, or you can take your break so then you can get your insulin or get your food in your system. But we're still, because we can't physically see it, we're not believing it. We're not taking it seriously. And that's a huge deal because we have all have lost someone because of suicide in this industry now. I would say the biggest issue in our industry right now is that enterprise teams, despite having access to amazing technology from companies like Tripwire, amazing tech, despite that, they're in a, a game that they often can't win because an enterprise team was never recruited, set up, and funded to fight a nation state. It just is not the way these things were set up. You go to work in a bank. I used to be on the board of a large bank, very familiar with how that industry works. Um, you set these things up to deal with enterprise grade threat. That's what you hire the team for. I'd been a CISO my whole life. That's what I signed up for, not to be a military leader. So <clears throat> there's this spectacular disconnect between the way we protect enterprise and the kinds of threats that they're dealing with. Now, admittedly, a lot of threats they can stop, certainly, you know, raising you know, from ankle biters up to even pretty advanced threats. And again, that's probably because there is so much good technology out there to deal with. But I don't care what vendor you're dealing with, including Tripwire, you can't put a, a tool in place and stop this massive nation state that's coming after you. So we don't talk about it much in our industry. It's one of these things that we, we, we just try, prefer not to think about. It's, it's inconvenient to think that despite having great people, great technology, great setup, great architecture, being determined, being hardworking, there's still this nation state that can come rotate your tires. And that's hard to think about. I, I consider that probably the number one challenge in our industry. And I think the way it's going to have to happen is enterprise teams are going to have to evolve to be set up to stop that kind of threat. And it's a little different, right? You work in retail and you've got an IT team that's doing law enforcement and dealing with nation states. That's a little, bizarre, frankly, marginally bizarre. But I think it's going to have to happen. Otherwise, we just have one after another, credential theft and breach and all that kind of thing. So um, we have a little bit of work to do. You know, I think that one of them that comes to mind for us, so there's there are a few that come to mind. So there is always the persistent um, complexity. And so it's the, the frequency and the complexity of the threats that we're seeing, right? But the challenge as well is that it's not always those really focused targeted threat actors. There are still so many threats that are just being 
um, channeled through these organizations that they have to just wade through. It's the volumes. So when I think about one of the most pervasive challenges, quite honestly, I think about our members who are always talking about the volume. And you couple that with a challenge in terms of resource constraints, if that's an issue, and it's a recipe for people who are going to be fatigued and something might get through. So I think that wherever we can filter through those volumes and focus on what matters, um, that's really the key. So on a kind of personal mission, if you would, that is to say, it's been something that, that I've been, I've been spending a lot of time researching over the last year and kind of really digging into. I feel like as an industry, we're really still failing at the overall data exfiltration problem. and trying to solve that problem at the last mile, I, I know no one will, will argue with me that that's not the way to do it. And granted, there are, we, we still need to protect those last miles for making sure data doesn't get out, but I feel like there's still so much more we can do uh, further upstream in, in the, the kill chain, if you would. Specifically, when we get to st staging data in particular, I think there's some opportunities there for us to, uh, to maybe make some improvements on how we detect and protect information, you know, post breach, but pre exfiltration, that still seems to be a significant problem that I've been personally just uh, on a mission to, to, to dig deeper into. In your opinion. So the biggest issues today in cybersecurity are actually the same ones we've been looking at for the last 10, 15, 20 years. We call it cybersecurity Groundhog Day. You know, like the Bill Murray movie with the groundhog reliving the same day over and over? That's what so many of us are now doing. A lot of the things we've been talking about 20 years ago, we're still talking about today, like access management, having a good inventory, making sure you have change control in place, having incident response, disaster recovery. So it's making sure we're still covering a lot of those basics, the basic blocking and tackling, if you will. Make sure we have those, and then we can get to the fun stuff like AI, ML, working with IoT and shadow IT. Make sure we're covering the basics, though, first.